Bye. Short bus debate club. It's a bus. Rolling. I can get on board. <laughs> Hello, I'm Darren Jolly. <laughs> it's time to get this short bus started. So let's roll. And on with the show. Hello, everyone. This is Brian Courtney with Short Bus Debate Club. Welcome to the Friday the 13th edition. It is. Bum, bum, bum. It is. Is is Freddy going to kill Jason? (laughs) I I don't know. So... I've never been incredibly superstitious, but I remember one day way back when we were getting ready to go out and party, and I told everybody, I was like, fuck, we got to make sure and be really good. I can't have any interactions with the cops because I've got a warrant out for my arrest, so no interactions with the cops because... I've got a warrant, and it's Friday the 13th. So we went out and raised a bunch of hell, and nothing happened. It was great. So I got home, I don't know, 4 o'clock in the morning or whatever, drunk, passed out. And like at fucking 8, my sister comes in and goes, Brian, the cops are here. And I was like, whatever, you're full of shit. And I laid back down, and she goes, no, they're really here. And I sat up in my bed, and I was like, you fucking kidding, right? She said, no. So I got up and got dressed, and I was getting ready to bolt, but they were there, like really there. (laughs) And so I am more nervous now about Saturday the 14th than I am Friday the 13th. Did you see that stupid fucking movie? That was funny. That was kind of funny. National Lampoons did a lot of good stuff. That that was National Lampoons that did that? Yeah. I don't see that anywhere. I haven't seen that movie like on anything ever. No, I don't think most people even know it fucking exists, dude. I mean, it was some stupid hacky shit, but it was funny as fuck. Yeah. Well, it was, I mean... You know, one of the satire type movies, and I'm pretty sure it was National Lampoons. Um, but I thought it was great. Then again, I like a lot of stupid movies, like when we were talking yesterday about the movies, and I said, you know, I'm not a huge fan of Judd Apatow or whatever. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, But then I said, well, you know, he did Walk Hard, the Dewey Cox story. That is another fucking stupid movie, but it just fucking cracked me up, dude. Who is the guy that plays Dewey Cox? John C. Riley. He's Uh, usually, that was like the first movie I think I'd seen him in where I haven't seen the movie, but it's the first, you know, at least through, I've never seen him be a lead in anything before. He's a good actor, and I like him because he plays a lot of the stupid comedy type stuff. Mm-hmm. But he's fucking a serious actor too. Dude, he in Magnolia, he played that cop that ends up with the uh, you know, the game show host's daughter, who's a fucking cokehead, and her dad had molested her. It was fucking horrible. But the cop that he played, he loses his gun during. Have you ever seen Magnolia? Mm-hmm. Uh, it was he did. He, I mean, he was just a dumb fucking cop, just a total fucking idiot. But the way that he played it was very, it was, it was cute. It was, a, it, I, I enjoyed that movie. Um, Saturday the Fourteenth is not National Lampoon's. Okay, so what's the, what is the fucking history of people being the Friday the Thirteenth shit? I mean, one of the things that they're talking about in this stupid thing that I just read real quick was that. Jesus had 12 apostles and he was number 13. And then he died the day after uh, they did their last supper, you know, which they knew was coming. But why is that? It's that was, I mean, it was pretty well telegraphed. That Jesus was going to get capped, you know? I mean, yeah. And I would think people would be more afraid of the 30th because of the silver thing. If that was the case, what, 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 what are you talking about? What's the silver thing? Judas sent us 30 pieces of silver for Selling Jesus out. Is that what he got paid? I didn't. I didn't realize that that was a. So then thirty would be unlucky. 
Well, I mean, if Jesus was the 13th apostle, then... I mean, I guess we're talking about something that's irrational by its very existence. So try to find a reason for it that makes sense. It's kind of cool. Well, and I mean, why? Because was it, was their last supper on a Friday? You know, I don't remember. I'm not sure. People are so fucking stupid. Why do they always have to tie everything to Jesus? I don't either. So, well, Darren is doing research on Friday the 13th and the unlucky number of 13 because, you know, you still can't find a hotel or maybe you yeah, can. Yeah, they have 13 floors. Yeah, they... They just skip it. Yeah. Which is also kind of stupid because that means, you know, that 14 is actually 13. They're just tricking you. Unless they so, really did build a 13th floor and, and then just, just skip it. it. Right. <laughs> that would be totally fucking weird, dude. Um, so this week we've been talking about choice and the illusion of choice. On Monday we kind of talked about, you know, conglomerates and how they're basically taking over everything. I mean, you know, we talked about some of them. We talked about Unilever. We talked about Procter & Gamble, Mars. Well, we didn't talk about the grocery stores as much as that must have been weird. what is in the grocery stores, um, what's on the shelves. Um, you know, the Dairy Farmers of America, Nestle Waters, we didn't talk a whole lot about Hershey, um, Coca-Cola, Pepsi. You know, we've mentioned them. But, but there's we oligopolies and monopolies. We know kind of. The fact is that all of these huge companies pretty much produce everything. So, I mean, I don't have an exact number. But really, you know, you're looking at less than 10 major companies that produce the vast majority of shit that's in the stores yeah. and that's not even you know distributors for produce and whatever so there is an illusion at, no at the store yes. um wednesday we talked about movies and how they push certain things on us and and we kind of you know went into some other directions but we started with the algorithms and stuff them them ranking things you know 95% for this and then them giving you suggestions for shit that they give you for 68% like what the fuck is that all about like uh, and the fact that these 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 you have AI and then machine learning positions that are I would like to see what that looks like you know the thinkers of you know when they're 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 constructing that space and like the flow chart or whatever yeah, yeah. What on, the, we, on the whiteboard. Yeah. What is it? What is this one trying to do? How does it work with the other ones when they come into contact with each other? Because that's really what it ends up looking yeah. like, though, is just like this flow chart. You know, they're saying, OK, and this isn't the code part. This is more like the planning project stuff. Yeah. You know, starting off at A, if, you know, they want B, then go to here. If they don't want B then, you know, C, and, you know, they start pushing yeah, you in these other different. directions, and it's all and or and this and equal to and... But you're giving the machine intention. I mean, that is just fucking weird, dude. I would call it more of a decision tree than a flow chart, I guess. No, then you and your fucking semantics, motherfucker. Okay, so we talked about... Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, you're not. You're not sorry. <laughs> but we ended up getting into a really dark area at the end. We kind of got off the the uh, the you know the computers tech because we thought you know YouTube and uh, just all these various different spaces that are essentially like foreclosing on. And we talked about Fauci and all those guys, like uh, uh, how you had one side that was saying uh, science, but it was only science according to Dr. Fauci and the, the people that hung out with him, anybody that was on the other side of that, anybody that wanted to talk about ivermectin mectin or whatever that shit's called, uh, was uh, trying to sell snake oil. Which I and the fact that, well, we went ended up talking about that 
that's what was public, and then they ended up making it secret as far as the disinformation. It was it wasn't actually an act because it wasn't legislation. It was. It was just they come. To, it was something through the executive branch that came out and said, "We're going to uh, fight disinformation that's in the public sphere," which literally was like. The, the ministry of it like literally sounded like it was right out of Orwell, you know, I mean, a lot of this shit, you know, when we talk about choice or the concepts of choice, it's funny. Like I was listening to, uh, cause that, you know, there was all that shit that was going on when Kevin McCarthy was not, you know, last, last week trying to become the speaker of the house. Um, and those, uh, that group of Republican senators were withholding their support because they were holding out to try to get concessions and 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 whatnot, but uh, there was this uh, comment that I was listening to Glenn Greenwald and uh, um, Brianna Joy Gray, where um, there are these spaces where these 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 situations are. It's like in the Soviet Union during the time period where you know you, you the 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 premier you know gets up and is giving a speech and you know says all these things and then the, the, he asks an individual in the you know so what's going to happen if you know if these things don't happen you know and these people don't do what we've asked them to do to be a part of the community like you're not allowed to say we're going to kill them we're going to eliminate them right because there's all these unheard of or unspoken rules that like we're creating this sort of fiction with the social system that we're recreating. And if you say the thing that's obviously a fact, that's almost worse than just coming out and like condemning someone publicly or something like that, because just, you know, like our, our democracy, you know, like we, we just have to, we go along. They were, they were talking about these instances where we go along with the flow and there's this unwritten thing where you just don't ever talk about the, the real structure that's moving things along because the myth is what we're supposed to endorse. And if you, you know, like choice, you know, you don't, you don't, I mean, the, the Republicans are the evil motherfuckers, you know, cause they, you know, don't, you know, they're, they're trying, they don't care about social programs. And then the Republicans are like those fucking Democrats just want to, you know, they want to just tax everybody and just take all the money and just be wasteful. And every dollar that they get out of them is a dollar lost. And if you say anything outside of that dynamic, like the Demopublican stuff or, or whatnot, um, then you really like the, like the education stuff going in the night, late nineties, like no child left behind. So, <laughs> so we're going to, we're going to have a test. Is the federal government going to produce the test or is the state going to produce the test? Oh, the Democrats thought that it should be federally, you know, and the 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 Republicans deferred to state right state rights, but you were not allowed to say, uh, you know, that you you decimated, you know, public funding, you know, the, that that uh, the real reason why is because we're just not investing in education in a meaningful way. You just have to say, I'm for the test in this way, or I'm for the test in this way. And we have definitely left children behind. Yeah, many. I mean, that teaching for the test shit. And, you know, I mean, all they do year after year, as far as I can tell, is just make the test easier to teach. Um, but they're not teaching these kids. But see, there's there's choice there, too, because now most states have these voucher programs, right? So you can choose to go to public school in the district where you live, or you can choose to take your voucher to a school district that is supposedly better. And I know that they're better in varying degrees. You know, I we talked about that in the education one where, you know, Taylor had leukemia. He had missed... I think it was four grades, you know, of, of school, but they can't start a fucking nine-year-old in kindergarten. 
So they've got to put them in the fourth grade, but they had given them all of these additional tutors and, and whatever. So he's here in Colorado schools, and he's four grades behind. And they tell him, you're four grades behind. You know, you can read at this level, do math at this level. They moved to Missouri, and suddenly he's in the correct grade, and he's a fucking honor roll student. That scares the shit out of me. I mean, who's coming out of Missouri public schools that knows anything? If all of the, and all of those things did happen, but if they're still happening, well, there's no doubt that structurally our education system is, like you said, there's a, there's a lot of people that are being being left behind but we don't even i mean like honestly like you, you so you suggest that there's there's another false choice there you know a voucher system the, the public versus the private position which is again these are these are false choices like but just to imagine that a person can go from one place to another but we don't again we don't really care about outcomes. I mean, we just care that the locomotive keeps running, you know? I mean, all anything concrete, anything substantial, you know, like it's all we're training them to be as cogs on the wheel. Yeah, it's a look, yeah, in the machine. It's like that uh did, did you watch um Snowpiercer? The movie? So I when you told me about Snowpiercer, I ended up watching the show not the movie. Um, and I quit watching, I think, after the first season. The show wasn't bad, but I think I've got to go back and watch the movie because I completely misunderstood you and I was watching the show. Yeah, I've, I've never watched the show at all. But um, the, the, the movie is sort of like an allegory about, you know, like class concepts inside of this train you know and even with a world that's dead and you've only got like three or four hundred people that are left or however many there were that were on this train you still have this like uh con concretely like developed set of social relations at the beginning of the film um the this crazy lady who's just fucking a lunatic and hilarious uh she's further up the train she's not at the top but she's a functionary that uh, helps to keep the people that are at the back of the train in order right and if you don't do what it is that you're told uh they'll take your ass and they'll open up the fucking door of the fucking train and they put your arm through like outside and the arm within seconds Freeze your freezes arm and then they smack it with a hammer and it fucking busts off it's fucking nasty weirdness but uh she comes she comes in and uh there are all these different weird things that they do they they look for a violinist they again there's a, a guy who who was causing trouble so they fucking broke his arm off but um somehow or another little kids uh get taken up to the front of the train to do something but they have no fucking idea what it is but they know that once the kid goes the kid never comes back so this uh uh, this black gal, she's the same lady who played uh, the Amity in uh, um, Divergent, Insurgent. You remember, she's the leader of the, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, she, the farmer people, she was the head of the farmer people. In oh, Insurgent. okay. The the one, the, the black lady that had the scar? I don't know if she had a scar. Did she have a scar? I mean, she's short, fat, you know. Yeah, she's, okay. She's a, I know a, I know who you're talking cool about. Ass, she's a cool-ass actress, but... Uh, um, she's got a little son that's like, you know, five years, five, six years old, and they come looking for a kid one day, and uh, they try to hide him, you know, but, you know, somebody points it out, and they take they take him from her, and that was sort of like the last straw moment to where they're like, we've got to get to the fucking front of the train, we got to save this kid, we got to change things the way that they're going, so when they get all the way up to the front of the train, Chris Evans is the, the main the main character, um the kid is put inside of this little space where uh 
they twist something and turn something to keep the train moving. And that's all the kid's there to do. And he gets fed well. You know, they keep him there. But you have to be this tiny little five. To... No, no regular human could go do it unless it was like Peter, what's his name? Uh, Cottontail? No, the midget from... Uh, Oh, Dinklage. Dinklage, yeah. Uh huh. That's not the preferred nomenclature, dude. But uh, <laughs> but you would have to have little people, or, and I think that he'd even be too big. But literally, like that is just clear a cog in the wheel, like like visualization as I as I had ever seen. You got to watch the fucking movie, dude. Well, I mean, even in the show, they they had the the classes. I mean. I, there were the people that had the fucking shit job of, you know, putting on that suit and checking the wheels. And it was so cold that even with the suit on, they could only be out there for whatever it was, five minutes oh. or, you know. Um. So, yeah, I I mean, I, I get it. And I will watch the movie. Um. I just have to remember because... I don't even know if it's on Netflix anymore. I don't think it is right now. No. I think it's on some. It's on Pluto or. Uh, yeah, but I won't watch those because you things. don't. Yeah, I, I hate commercials too. I get it. That's why I do the premium YouTube, which I hate doing because I don't like the way YouTube censors stuff. But whatever. So, I I know that we're gonna probably go in a lot of different directions here, but you know, I mentioned on the New Year's episode that I was gonna start drinking again, and I have. Um, it's always good when you follow through with your resolution. But, um, well, it just reminded me because I had just opened a beer. That was one thing that we didn't talk about. And, you know, all of the breweries, for some reason. What, what was beer? Oh, beer as a choice? Yeah. Started doing these mergers and, and acquisitions and everything in late 90s, early 2000s. You know, so now Coors isn't Coors, it's Molson Coors. Well, I just looked it up and just the Molson Coors, they have 128 different brands of beer. Uh -huh. So that means that's a large portion of the beer cooler when you walk in. Yeah, that's it. Um, Anheuser-Busch was purchased by SAB and SAB What's was, SAB? Uh, it was South American something. Um, South or South American South African, maybe I don't know. I can't Africana. remember. Um, but then they became because somebody else purchased them, so they became A B M B E V I N B E V. Well, N B E V has over five hundred different brands of beer with Anheuser Busch and all of the other that, shit. That, sorry, because Anheuser Busch bought that fire. Right. So I mean. Between Molson Coors and InBev, that's the entire fucking beer cooler. Come on, I don't want. I just want to see the list of the InBev beers. That's all I want to see. Uh, if you go to tapintoyourbeers.com. Oh, fuck. So there's all the all the buds, Bush, Bush Light, Corona, all the Coronas, Modelo. Pacifico, Victoria, Natural White, Nasty Ass Shit, Shock Top, Stella Artois, um, Zeigenbach, I don't know what that is. All the Breckenridge Brewery, and I didn't realize that they had been purchased. I thought they were still they independent, apparently. Wow, dude, they have, I mean, dude, they have, like, on Wikipedia, they have it broken down in the fucking countries. Red Hook. I mean, dude, so seriously, it really is between the two of them and InBev. With over 500, it's it really is the entire fucking beer cooler. And that's, you know, the hard seltzers and canned wines and all of the shit that is in the cooler. It's all coming from essentially two companies. So we, you know, I mean... Oh, fuck it. I'm going to boycott Red Hook. I don't like what they're doing. Or I'm going to boycott Breckenridge because they opened up too many yuppie restaurants in the city and metro area of, of Denver. Um, well, that's uh, go ahead and boycott them. You think InBev is going to give a fuck 
and especially if you start buying Stella because you're boycotting. This is a this is a closed system now. I mean, like everything is. I mean, it's interesting because people still use the word capitalism, but when you get to the point where all of this stuff is so centralized, so fucking centralized, and the rhetorical disposition is that, you know, competition this and competition that, but we've gone over that. There's, I mean, there's no competition. You only are competitive if you find a better way to make the position more centralized. Like Walmart did this weird thing with the way that they could uh, do all their inventory in, in the evenings and they, you know, and they just fucking dominated everything. If Rubbermaid doesn't, you know, do things at the price we do them. They boot them. Not only they boot them, they, they, when they cut the contract, they end up having to file bankruptcy and shit like that because their, their market down position. Uh, if you can't sell to Walmart, then you, I mean, everything else is not enough because their market, uh, what is that market share is so, is so significant. So like the next thing after that was when the stupid online bookstore, you know, turned into what it was and they organized it. They did what Walmart did, but they did it on a much larger scale the biggest scale that we, you know, so that's the next, the next space, you know, what, what is the, and it's, again, it's not about, you know, being a mom and pop, you know, going and creating your, nice little restaurant you know i mean it's about whether or not you can be a fucking master of the universe and organize the 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 world in a more efficient way that is for all intents and purposes totally centralized this is not capitalism the only good thing about amazon versus walmart and you know what's scary is that all of the small mom and pops used to say well we're fucking scared of Walmart. We don't want them in our neighborhoods. Well, now Walmart is scared of fucking Amazon. Yeah. They're the, they're the bigger fish. Yeah. Um, you know what I think of when I think of mom and pops being afraid of Walmart? is a fucking mystery Alaska where that kid ends up fucking... They got the... It's a, it's a fake Walmart one. He, and he shoots the fucking barrel. Yeah. And ricochets ricochets off the shovel and whatever. <laughs> Hits him in the fucking foot. Yeah through the dog food or some shit that's a good movie i like Dude, that it's movie. fucking hilarious i love it you know any place where i could get a rub and a tug <laughs> but that i mean yeah that 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 was a small community that was afraid of the big the big giant coming in but the big giants come in no matter what we do yeah there's no way to stop them boulder tried to stop walmart forever and you know they they're not in downtown boulder uh-huh. but they're in Boulder. The same thing happened in Littleton with that one in Quincy. You know, they, they, they tried to not let that happen, but there was just, what, I mean, how yeah. do you fight, you know? It's not City Hall. I mean, it's, how do you fight the fucking Soviet fucking, you know, corporate machine? So it's, it's crazy. The thing I was going to say, though, about Amazon is that, and not that it makes it a whole lot better, because essentially all it does is make Amazon richer. But, you know, you said, like, if Rubbermaid can't keep up with the demand of Walmart, then they end up having to file bankruptcy and whatever. Well, Amazon will let a mom and pop sell via Amazon. I guess Walmart does nowadays, too, and and so does Target. Um, So a lot of times when you're shopping, you got to be careful and make sure that it's, being sold by whoever you're trying to buy it from. But they'll let you, you know, if you've got a small manufacturing company, you can sell your shit through Amazon. Of course, again, you give them a probably a huge percentage because I know when I self-publish the book through them, they take a, a huge percentage um, of the book. So I'm sure that they're, you know, you got to give up depending on how much you're pushing through their website. I'm sure it's at least 10%, if not more. There's there's actually this really um, good uh, thing on YouTube uh, done by this guy by the name of Matt Stoller through, through the Breaking Point stuff, but it's called Matt Stoller Exposing the Amazon Prime Scam. 
and he starts by talking about uh, how how Prime got everybody directed. I mean, because of the logistics side of things. Mm-hmm. But he also goes into this discussion about uh, if you want to be the first one that shows up, you know, you you can pay for uh, you pay them X amount of dollars to if somebody's going to search for you know for dog food or whatever, you know, you 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 pay them X amount of dollars to be the first one to come up in this specific like uh, search point. And there's all kinds of other things that you can do. But I mean, like you said, when you, you, you start by doing this one thing, but that's not getting you enough. You have to do all of these various different things to get yourself in a space where you're the box. You're the one that's, you know, first up that's going to. Well, yeah, but that, I mean, I was just talking when I said the percentage. So that's just if your product sells. Mm-hmm. So I make cups, my cup sells. I give them 10% of the sales yeah. price, whatever. But then Amazon makes more money because you can pay for advertising. And that's what you're talking about where you move them up in the box and whatever. But they've got it broken down to where you can do this type of advertising where it shows up on PCs and this type of advertising where it shows up on your tablet. You can do this type of advertising to where it shows up when somebody's reading their Kindle. So if they end up buying a book about dogs, then now your dog food is going to be advertised to that person because Because they're reading that particular book. Yeah. Yeah. But you have to pay those tributes. I mean, all those fucking tributes. I mean... Again, is is this a free fucking marketplace, you know? I don't know, dude. I don't think so. I think we're just, uh, we're paying 10 companies. Yeah. That's it. And, you know, I, I, I don't know. I bought a shitty fucking comforter from Amazon when I moved over here. Mm-hmm. Amazon made the fucking comforter. You know, so now, you know, we talked about all of the shit that they own. Now they're producing things. As well. But they're in manufacturing, too. And the reason that, that is a problem is because Biden was talking about all of these things he's going to do this year to counteract inflation and make the economy better. Yeah, the inflation Reduction Act and all that bullshit. Which I read and... You know, there are a few books I've read that actually made me laugh out loud. Lamb was one of them. I laughed out loud when I read Catch-22. Um, but when I read the Biden shit, I fucking laughed out loud. <laughs> because Comparing the Biden uh, desires to bring down, the policies to bring down inflation well, compared to... Christopher Moore's lamb. Yeah, dude. I mean, it was a fucking joke. And one of the things that bothered me was that they were talking about a corporate tax. Okay, that's great. But there was this, I don't want to call it a loophole, but there was this caveat that if you were in manufacturing, you didn't have to pay that full corporate tax you paid less. So he just has to go and diversify a position into the corp- or to the manufacturing side. Right. So now Amazon can argue, well, we're in manufacturing. We manufacture comforters. We manufacture sheets. We manufacture pencils. Um, so I don't know if that just means that that one particular component of Amazon doesn't have to pay or if because it all depends on how they've written it up. You know, is it a wholly owned subsidiary or is it Amazon? Um, Dude never pays taxes. There's well, I know, but I mean, yeah, I, I, apparently I, he's still not going to have to pay taxes. I mean, he's, I mean, he's got his, you know, his uh, stable full of fucking lawyers that are there for that one specific reason, you know? And it's like, Like, this is the world that you live in. This is the, I mean, do you, like, how much, 200 billion? Like, how much do you need? What What is it that you're trying to accomplish at that point in time? You know? 
we, I, I'm sure you're taking your low T stuff, you know, so you're, you know, and, and now I actually saw a picture. It was on Rogan a couple weeks ago where they showed uh, him when he was doing Amazon out of his garage and him now. And he's like, he looks like fucking Dana White. You know, he looks like a fucking, you know. Oh, is he huge now? Yeah, he's all buff. Because yeah. he used to show up to a lot of those shows that I would go to, you know, the cybersecurity shows, not concerts, uh-huh. but, you know, the yeah, different it. trade yeah, shows. Uh-huh. And, of course, he would show up to the Amazon Web Services ones. And, you know, I never was close enough to, to shake his hand, but I was definitely close enough to where I could have fucking hit him in the head with something if I just tossed it. I mean, you know, totally 15, lo- 20 lo- feet. Totally a lost opportunity. Um, a javelin right through his melon. Right. Uh and he wasn't big then, but I don't know. Like I was thinking about that. Like if I actually won the mega millions thing, Uh you know, and I'm doing what everybody else does, except instead of saying, well, I can buy this and this and this, I was thinking, okay, I can give this much to that person and this much to that person. I did say I was going to buy some stuff, but the stuff I was going to buy probably wasn't for the same reasons. Like I wanted to buy a whole shitload of land and not because I thought it was a good investment or, you know, I I was thinking, but I was thinking I want to buy the land so that fucking Walmart can't build a store. So the developers can't build a fucking bunch of new fucking housing, you know, I wanted to buy the land to preserve the fucking land. Um, but you know the problem with that, like almost immediately, is that those motherfuckers can claim eminent domain on almost anything, you know? I mean, they could force it out of you. I mean, I don't, that doesn't mean that I don't think it's a good idea to do that stuff. I think it's a great idea to do that stuff. I think it's great to put fucking you know, guard towers on the corners of those fucking lands and like electric, you know, fences or so- something so that, yeah. you know, non-lethal ways to, uh, or lethal, person. lethal ways. I, I just want to start at the beginning, not killing people like straight out. I mean, if I got guard towers, obviously I'm not shooting them with rubber bullets. Right. Know? So, but, uh, no matter what, yeah, anything can, we could say anything with regards to a strategy and then know that they, there's already a, a position that they could combat. But if we're not at least stepping out, you know, but if I had won the Powerball, yeah. And I had $1.3 billion, uh-huh. then I could have a whole fleet of lawyers too to fight back and say, no, you're not taking my you shit. Your lawyers are domain. Against, you're not just fighting one person, you're fighting the system. Oh, yeah, okay. but I, you get my point. Of course. Yeah, of course. Um, so, whatever. I mean, obviously, I, I didn't win the Mega Millions or $1.3 billion. Um, so I guess I'm still just a fucking cog in the machine. Yeah, and we're stuck making choices just like... Ah. <laughs> I think we're just stuck. Making... Well, when I Thinking said making that choices, we're making yeah, choices. It was definitely a scare quote. Comment, yeah. So. But it would be neat... Like, if you had, like, enough resources to where you could at least create an antithesis to the, you know, to, to the existing system. You know, just something that just says... I know we were talking beforehand about uh, like Franz Fanon and the wretched of the earth. Um, and French or Fanon was talking a lot in that book uh, about how the, uh, the Africans, the indigenous African people who were fighting against the colonizers did not have the resources uh, to really combat, you know, whether it be France or Germany or England or whoever, Holland, whoever it is. But that doesn't mean that you don't commit the act. Like, and he and Fano was arguing about violence that you could, and it's just like doing an African dance, you know, with your tribe in front of, you know, but you do it to demonstrate your fuck you to the colonizer, which is essentially if you had the resources to do something like this, even though you know it's absolutely a losing battle, unless some miracle fucking happens and you know, the, the world, you know, tilts all of a sudden in some other fucking direction and the poles switch places and, 
you know, some, something happens to where we do effectively socially transform the way that the system reproduces itself. But in lieu of that happening, you at least have to be doing the symbolic act. Okay, so then, and I know what you're talking about, like um, in Brazil, what the fuck is the name of that, that dance fighting? Oh, so, um, capoeira? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they, I mean, that entire fucking thing was developed because they weren't allowed to learn how to fight so they or they had to kind of disguise it. And that's how Capowider came about. Um, Those motherfuckers can kick some ass too, dude. Well, maybe. I don't know. I've never actually seen them in a real fucking fight. Um, you know, it's kind of like the all of the fighting positions of, of Kung Fu. You know, there's a dragon and a horse and fucking all of these other animals tiger eagle whatever well they're solid and they they work really well for conditioning but you know if you're in a fucking fight and you break into fucking horse position are you gonna actually be able to to do anything with it i don't i don't know the answer um Dude, the, the speed of capoeira when they're doing it like I'm pretty sure you could at least give somebody a little bit of a, a little bit of love. Well, know? it had to be somewhat effective. I mean, because it's still around, even though it was developed. I don't even know when the fuck it was developed, but I know why it was developed. Um, oh, that's right. There was a guy in UFC that actually did do did do it. Did he get his ass kicked? I don't think that he lasted forever. I mean, I think that he was pretty one-dimensional. You know, you can't just... It, it, and, and on some level, if you get used to it, it, it there are some dangers to it, like there's the Taekwondo. You know, it's more like more like dancing, like you're saying, than it is really... Like, it, like judo is something that... You, because you can use throws, you know? You can use judo as a com combat against somebody when they're trying to wrestle you or shoot, you know? Um and some things uh, like karate took a took a minute to, but the dragon I can't remember what that guy's name was. He ended up being the light uh, heavyweight champion for a little while. The dragon. Uh, uh, that was he was a, he was a Don karate. the Dragon Wilson. No 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 no. This was a, in UFC. Oh. Um, I can't remember what. So Capoeira was developed in the 15th century. Oh, wow. So, so it's been around for a long time. Well, if Wikipedia is correct. But then again, it might not be because then it says it was developed in 1888. Huh. So, Leota Machida. He 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 kicked the fuck out of some people. Like I remember, I was I was uh, in Vegas with Frank and and them. I think we were out there playing or something. But uh, he fought uh, Evans and just. Beat, beat the fuck out of him, and he was the light heavyweight for a minute. But there was limitations because karate, again, like. But now I'm going off on a, on a tangent. Well, so what I was gonna say, and when I started talking about the capoeira, is you know, let's for just now because I don't think we can call them colonizers anymore. But people in power regardless of where they are or where they came from, continue to, you know, put others under their thumb. So what can one do if those in power, because if it's our choice, you know, at the grocery store and there's 10 companies, then those 10 companies might change slightly, but they're the same 10 companies in the UK. They're the same 10 companies in Australia. Um, so they're not colonizers anymore, are they? I mean, they're... Yeah, I don't refer to it as colonizers. 
colonialism. I hear people talk about it and say neocolonialism. I don't, I don't know that that makes sense because there's something that's a little bit more uh, like you had, you know, specific people in, in, like I said, you know, the people that were fucking with people in South Africa, it was very specific, you know, groups of people that were tied back to Europe. Now, like the cross pollination and, and investment, you know, it's not it's not bound to one, Japan, it's not bound to Germany, it's not bound to the United States. Like their your your interests and and even if you're a competitor, like their interests are more like the competitor's interest than their interest is relative to the person who is not being colonized but is experiencing this sort of form of power in a much more dynamic and like all encompassing way. It's, I mean, it's because to- it, 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 it's like, I don't want to say it's global because it's not complete entirely, but it's definitely something that transcends. Well, and they're starting, they're, they're steering our legislators in directions that they want to see. And like, you know, they always hedge their bets and they make sure to donate to both the Democrats and the Republicans, at least here in the United States. Labor and the Tories in right. the UK, whatever. Um, but I mean, it's... So in Romania, and I, I say this because I was there so often, I, I saw it, but I mean, these huge companies from Germany and France were coming in and, you know, building grocery stores and they were having the Romanians build algorithms for them so that they could take them back to Germany and France and, and whatever. So, I mean, you're seeing these countries where these corporations are headquartered and, and have more money going into these poor areas, which we've been doing forever. Sure. I mean, we've been going to Vietnam, Bangladesh. Yeah. That's where we end up manufacturing whatever it is we're wearing because it's cheaper. Disposable to, reserve I mean, of labor, plus, like you said, the, the, you're, or at least you're suggesting, um, the environmental policies, the labor policies, are not as uh, developed in those places, so you can... You don't have to, uh, you know, care about whether or not you're dumping fucking nasty ass shit in rivers and making people have three eyes or fucking getting cancer when they're four years old. Right. I don't know that we're that worried about that. We have to pretend like we are. And and don't get me wrong. I'm worried about it. And you're worried about it. A couple of the woke neighbors are worried about it. But the legislators aren't worried about it. Yeah. And, and, it, and it's interesting because another thing that you were, when you said, like, so they're creating these legal structures. Uh, one of this guy that I liked a lot when I was still going to the academy was a guy named Stephen Gill. And he talked about uh, uh, these two ideas, disciplinary neoliberalism. This is pretty much, you know, I mean, just austerity, you know, and, and uh, killing any public positions, you know. I mean, but this other idea that he talked about was this idea called new constitutionalism. And one of the ways that he tried to illuminate this was when NAFTA got put into effect. Uh, we, I think we asked, we, we said, if you want to be Mexico, if you want to be part of NAFTA, you're going to have to revise your constitution in these 23 different ways, because to be very clearly clear, we don't like communal lands. We, we don't want anything that looks like communal lands or communal uh, agricultural positions to have uh, any any strong legal foothold anymore. So like ejidos, you know, and I know this I didn't mention this before, but this is an important concept to understand if you're talking about uh, how different legal structures are being shifted and transformed to fit a specific logic of power, you know, that's beholden to capital. Um, ejidos were eliminated. And ejidos were communal lands that were uh, owned inside of social spaces in Mexico that do not exist anymore. Well, it was kind of like Zapatistas and shit like that. Kind of like sharecropping here, but you know, the sharecropping went away too. Um, and that was really just a way for, you know, former slaves to continue doing what they were doing, but being able to make a living while doing it. 
whatever that living was. I mean, we still fucked with sharecroppers. Yeah, because they didn't own they didn't own the land, did they? I think some of them ended up being like a co-op where they would have owned the land, but some of them were working the land for yeah. someone else. It's like feudal. I and, mean, it's like feudalism still. Right. Um, but I know I've seen movies where they talked about, you know, how a certain number of families would get together and buy these properties in order to, you know, work the land and be able to have a place to live and, and build a house and, and whatever. Um, how many families did that? I don't know. That would be something I would have to research. And my guess is it would be tough. There's a kid that I referred to as the anarchist kid. His name's is Steven. Um, one of the things that he does um, and the groups of people that he sort of like connects to and they try to organize with his and his wife, I think, is a, is a lawyer that deals with um, legal issues in relation to this. But they they take properties, you know, where people live and they they have eight people that invest in it and then they have shares in those properties. They share them communally. And there are all these uh, legal spaces inside of Denver specifically, like on city council that uh, say that you, you're not allowed to have more than, you know, X amount of uh, people that are not part of the same family living in a house if it's not zoned as an apartment or as a, you know, set of condominiums or something like that. And uh, they fought back and forth over this for, for a long time. But it is one of those moments where they're trying to create that something that looks like that communal space where you are working together, which, I mean, if you're doing that, you're you're creating a whole new way of thinking about how family functions. You know, your family connects to these people that you don't have blood with, but you see them every day in there. You know, you make you break bread all the time together. You clean the fucking toilet together. You know, you go outside and you you might have some, you know, corn that you grow, some beets, some some greens, you know, and you do that all together, which is not the fucking nuclear family. But when they when they function like this, they've gotten so much fucking blowback from like not blowback, but pushback trying to stop them from from doing this thing that reflects that communal sort of like. Well, dude, anytime we think that we have an alternate idea or an alternate choice, if the government can't figure out a way to make money off of it, then they're going to push back. So the miniature house I thought was a great fucking idea. You know, no longer do you have to build a fucking McMansion you know, so there's all these mini houses. Well, what's a mini house? I don't know. This. It's just a smaller house. It's something that is form following function. It's not fucking 8,000 square feet. Is it kind of like those little ones that are kind of like by Federal and Alameda, like back in those neighborhoods there? No, no. Tiny houses are... are I don't even know. I think they call them tiny houses, miniature houses, something, but they're smaller houses. So sometimes they're almost like a camper. Like I've seen them to where the kitchen is actually just on the outside of it, where there's just like a sink and shit on the outside underneath a, like a canopy. Kind of yeah. Um, so the, all of them are a little bit different, but they're just smaller houses. What and the fuck do they have those? But look it up on your tablet, dude. They they were building them for a while. But what I was gonna what say is, called? miniature houses, yeah. tiny houses. Um, people started buying these things and putting them on land around Colorado. Well, suddenly, you know. I think uh, down where Durango is, is that La Plata County. Um, all of these counties started saying, no, that doesn't qualify as a house. You can't put that because it, it's not X and it's not Y. Um, 
And the real reason that they were doing it was because they weren't going to generate as much tax revenue off of them. Um, that and probably some developers said, well, if you let me have that land, I could build six houses instead of, you know, that one tiny house or whatever. I, I don't know what all of the arguments were. I'm pretty sure, though, that it boiled down to revenue generation. Um, but again, it was a way to where if somebody did do that, like let's say, you know, eight families bought a decent sized chunk of land, five, ten acres, they could have put, you know, a bunch of tiny houses on this little chunk of land and all lived together. But that wasn't going to work for, for those counties. Um, so anytime we think that we've got something where, you know, it might work for somebody with less income or just because you wanted to do it for, I don't know, environmental reasons or any number of reasons why you'd want to buy a tiny house, counties across the country are making it more difficult in order to to do that did you find anything no I, I i am but i need to find something i mean there was like a frame concepts i think like, there was a documentary called tiny house revolution uh -huh. and there was one lady or person some i think up in washington who wanted to help the homeless so she had a chunk of land and she put a bunch of these tiny houses up uh -huh. you know and there were rules couldn't drink and you couldn't do this and whatever. And as long as they were following those rules, then they could live in these tiny houses. And those houses that she put up were incredibly tiny houses, but there's a bunch of them. Um, I'll just, I don't know, talk about something while I look this up so I can kind of I mean, give was, you some specs. I was looking at them, but most, I mean, first, of course, they're like shooting up fucking doll houses. And I'm like, motherfuckers, I'm really trying to find something. So, there was an A-frame concept that, that looked like it sort of made sense to me. There was this other one that looked like, a, I don't know, looked like you'd be fucking down by the Highlands or Edgewater or something like that. But it was you could buy it for $36,000. It's confab, you know. Now, see, these are more like RVs. These are on wheels. Oh, uh -huh. um, and these look like the ones that the lady was putting those homeless people in. Um, now... These on wheels, I could see why a county would say, no, you can't have those here because that's not considered a house. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't just the ones on wheels that a lot of the counties were fucking with people because these are more like trailers or RVs. You're going camping, mm -hmm. so it's not considered a permanent residence. Um but if they had one like that, why were they fucking with them, though? I, I would not, just... Not the wheels one. Right. The other ones that were stationary. I It had something to do with square footage and, and all of this other bullshit, dude. I mean, I can't remember all of the arguments, but... One thing that kind of... I mean, people can do whatever the fuck they want. But one thing that kind of I found appealing... Uh, in relation to Stephen and what that that community of people were doing was the fact that they were literally you're reconceiving of how your social relationships like how you if you he, he and his wife had a child a couple of years ago so this child is being brought up in this house with all of these people that are essentially like his aunts and uncles and non-binary you know family members you know it, it 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 creates this different kind of way where we stop thinking about things in terms of private versus public you know it's dynamic so it sort of transcends that it creates this new space where you really get to think about a different way of living day to day of helping each other day to day when you get sick when you get uh, when you need help, you know, when, when you're in a position to where you can, uh, 
And it's not just contained to the family. It's not this biological thing, you know. These other people become your brothers and sisters, you know. They become your family. I like if it's just a small house. I mean, it, you and maybe there's other ways that you could. Maybe you have like this plot of land where you have like seven or eight small houses, you know. You're all there. It, you, you don't have a good toilet, but you you build a toilet spot in the middle, you know, that's got a nice fucking shower that connects to it and maybe a fucking bubble bath or, I mean, a, 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 a whirlpool, you know, like a, a, you know what I'm saying? Some These spaces that you share, because you're not, I mean, you're not going to have in these little houses, do you have like a little fucking... Yeah, they have, they have bathrooms and shit in them. Uh-huh. And... Again, so the ones I'm looking at, for some reason, all have wheels on them. Uh When I first started seeing the tiny house concept, they were actually houses. Mm -hmm. So, you know, plumbing was dug and they had electricity running to them. All of these are talking about, you know, generators and and whatever. Um, You know, so I'm guessing that it was more like an RV type toilet in a lot of these, but they can and have built actual tiny houses. Um, And the difference is, is that again, it's not 8,000 square feet. Like Roger moved to Parker because he thought that that house that they were living in over off of Bellevue was too small. Like that. that was a badass house. And I know that they wanted to have kids and all of that stuff. But even with two kids, that house out in Parker is too fucking big. Yeah. It's huge. There's no reason for anybody to live in a house that big. Um, but I guess that was their choice. Yeah. <laughs> or they're not, they're not a choice. Right. That was what everybody in the government wanted them to do. That was what Amazon wanted them to do. Um, okay. So I found this place called tiny home builders. Let's see if this is different. Yeah. These don't look like they're on wheels. So, oh no. They're on wheels. Never mind. We represent the lollipop kids. So um, just as while you're looking up, try to find us one without wheels. Um, I mentioned something about the striking clause in the American or American Postal Workers Union uh, contract. And this is actually what it says uh, in terms of striking. This is Article 18 from our contract, the current contract. And it says, it just is quick. There's four little parts here real quick. So Section 1, Statement of Principle. The union on behalf of its members agree that it will not call or sanction a strike or slowdown. Section two, union actions. The union or its local unions, whether uh, called locals or by other names, will take reasonable action to avoid such activity and where such activity occurs immediately inform striking employees they are in violation of the agreement and order said employees back to work. Section three, union liability. It is agreed that the union or its local unions, whether called locals or by other names, which comply with the requirements of this article shall not be liable for the unauthorized action of their members or other postal employees. And then the last article is uh, legal impact. Uh, The parties agree that the provisions of this article shall not be uh, used in any way to defeat any current or future legal actions involving the constitutionality of existing or future legislation prohibiting federal employees from engaging in strike actions. The parties further agree that the obligations undertaken in this article are in no way contingent upon the final determination of such constitutional issues. So it sounds to me like mainly all they're doing is making the post office they're releasing them from all liability if a strike happens i mean there's some other stuff there but that is what really stuck out to me was you know the post office can't be held liable for its members well but i I mean i think implicit in what they're saying there though too is that if you do it then you are you know the contract is you know 
and that it's the union's responsibility to make sure that you know all union actors in the APWU uh, understand that if you're doing this, you're stepping outside of your rights and your responsibilities, as a, which means that you're making it strike everything strike proof, which I think is just utterly obnoxious. So strike is power, you know, and you don't have any real power without without some sort of ability to threat. Well, as far as I'm concerned, and I know that everybody wants it just because it makes everyone feel safe and secure. But as far as I'm concerned, the a contract to tell you you can or can't strike is fucking retarded. And, terms, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, telling me that it's illegal is like a, strikes right. are supposed to be. It's like civil disobedience, like I'm not doing it because I'm trying to be on the right side of the law in this moment. Right. You know, I I want to gather 15 or 20 like minded people here that, you know, think our wages suck, that they're mistreating us, they're overworking us, etc. And it's got me over there. Was that he's on, no, he's on my lap. Oh, well, that's what it was then. Okay, so I know you guys can't see these pictures, but and this one's on wheels too. But this is a badass little house. Um, it's thirty by ten, and I mean, check it out, dude. That's fucking sweet. It's got fucking solar on it. It's got a full kitchen. Everything runs together. I mean, but that's what you're going to have, right? I mean, it's badass. Hardwood floors, which isn't necessarily a good thing when you're talking about a tiny house, but right there. Yeah. So, I mean, and this one's... 245 grand so i think if i was gonna spend that much money i'd just buy one of those badass rvs that you know will go anywhere of course those start at 500,000. so i really would have to win the fucking powerball on yeah, that, yeah, it, but. that that right there looks like it would be a pretty good fifth wheel you know yeah i don't think you can tow this thing around so that's another stupid thing like i mean it's got and it might be fake rock, but it's got uh, rock all around the outside on the facade. So you're not towing this thing from campsite to campsite. So for these counties that are saying, you know, we don't allow campers, it's kind of stupid. Um, you're going to go to a, like a trailer park. I mean, generally speaking, if you have something like that. Yeah, but just fucking chalk the wheels. Put something up on the outside to where they can't see them, and it looks like a house. Um, anyway, so that's one more choice that they've kind of taken away from us for whatever reason. Um, so, yeah, our, our choices are becoming fewer and fewer, farther and farther between. It's odd because when you see, like, people try to function as actors – Presently, this 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 pe peculiar space where choice is being foreclosed upon so clearly, like, I mean, I just think about both the way that people responded during COVID after uh, George Floyd was murdered by the police, um, and the way that the January six folks functioned. Uh, all of the actions that these individuals commit to is just cathartic again like and i i know i just said that thing about fano and on some level there's the a person from either one of those could say how is that different from you know what you were saying if we're making we're making this symbolic act you know i mean and on some level i have to kind of acknowledge that but at the same time like the way that people looked on january 6th was just like hooligans you know they just looked like idiots you know and if you go up and you just throw a fucking, uh, like a rock through a fucking Starbucks, you know, glass, all you're doing is raising the, the cost of insurance for 
for biz- businesses and for you know for anybody else that has an insurance policy which is another fucking racket yeah. and another lack of choice is just the insurance companies yeah, yeah. i mean we're literally required that now we're required to have health insurance right isn't that yeah sorry i didn't mean to interrupt no no, no, you, no but... it's the same no it's i mean it, it 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 is it's the same kind of like i mean the point is just that we really don't know how to commit to an act because we don't even know how to understand the concept of choice in the first place that's probably a true statement. I mean, I don't know. And and I'm doubting everything I've ever done in my life now, wondering if and who or what steered me into said decision, you know? I mean, a lot of it was done out of necessity, I think. Um, like, what do you mean more specifically? I, like, you know, when I was throwing newspapers when I was 12 years mm-hmm. old, um, I wanted some extra money. Money's tight, so I'm earning my my own. I stumbled into sales um, out of that necessity thing. Um, and I haven't really looked back since, but I mean... I I don't know if it was my choice to do any of that shit. And if you sit there and, you know, that's that's like a chicken and an egg kind of thing that we don't even, I mean, the only thing that we know for sure, you know, and of course, like if we go back to the very beginning of this project that we started, I'll give you so much shit about, you know, your, uh, you'd make the argument, well, if everybody was voting, you know, and then if everybody was writing those letters, if everybody was doing this and everybody was doing that. Um, of course, my my position is not don't don't do these things, but it still takes us back into that space where we are both incredibly cynical people, but you still have uh, faith and a desire for at least that sort of like ideation of well, if everybody was voting and we were all sort of like in on what it was that was happening, at the very least, there would be, you know, 100% engagement by all the in, the interested parties or something like that, or 80% or 85%, something a lot better than 42% or whatever it is that we have right now in this fucking embarrassing space. Um, but it start, you know, the voting, but then it turned into the you know, the website and the Demopublican shit and then the writing the fucking book and the, you know, I mean, all of these left turns. I mean, you could ask the same question about that. Were those your choices? You know, I mean, on some level, you, obviously they are because you've done a bunch of weird shit that not a lot of other people around you have, have done, you know, engaged in, but, you know, and now we're sitting here having these conversations on a fairly regular basis and incredibly publicly, you know, trying to sort of like, negotiate the question of if those aren't choices then what is a real choice you know is there any real choice that a person can make uh that allows for a space to open up to where some, some sort of difference can be yeah, made or freedom that you're you're actually an actor at that point in time you're not just something that's functioning in this constructed space that's you know, the matrix that, that, that has been constructed for us. Yeah, where this is the freedom that they let us have. Here, you're free to run around this yard all you want. <laughs> don't don't leave the yard, though. And, you know, I mean, that's like any housing development that they build now. You know, it's all full of cul-de-sacs and it's full of fucking streets that are the same name. And, and it doesn't matter which fucking city you're in. They're all the same way. And I still think that the reason that they do that is because they want everyone boxed in to a certain area, and they don't want them leaving that area. And if they do, they don't want them leaving that area for very long. Mm -hmm. And I'm paranoid, but that, I think, goes back to a lot of being able to know where we are at all times and boxing i mean try to fucking run away from the cops on one of those things you end up rolling your fucking car driving through somebody's house dude (laughs) um i don't know so 
we're uh, no closer to figuring out how much freedom we actually have or, or what choices are actually ours. Um, we are at an hour and 15 minutes, so oh, wow. we've got to <laughs> kind of make the decision on whether or not we're going to end the show. Should we make that choice? Oh, yeah, I got I got to work at 6 o'clock in the morning. i got to get up at the butt crack of dawn. I'm very excited to get back to the post office as soon as I possibly can. All right. Well, we know where Darren's going after he gets off the bus. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what I'm doing, but uh, the bus is coming to a stop, so you guys need to vamoose. Um Short Bus Debate Club at Yahoo.com. And don't forget, we're taking off next week. So if you want, you can make the choice to catch up on some old episodes. Indeed. And if anybody has any thoughts, please feel free to reach out. Yeah. Have a good weekend and a nice week following that. And we'll see you in 10 days or so. Adios. Hasta luego.